lately I've been listening to all of Bjork's albums. Oh, really? Do you know Bjork? Yes. Yeah. This woman? Jesus, I just discovered her. Wow. <laughs> She's just blowing me away. I'm going through one album after the next. Uh, Homogenic is just a masterpiece. She's it's, amazing. Man, I figured you guys would know. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I listen to pop culture at night because that's what I grew up with, I was listening to all that. Play classical music in the daytime for my neurons. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I don't know how we got on my schedule, but <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> that's good. No, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, we're rolling. All right. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for sitting down with us, uh, yeah, John my pleasure. David Ebert. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what you do. I'm a cultural critic. I guess that's the most neutral term you could apply, but I'm a lot of things. Uh, I'm an astrologer, but also uh, uh, an intellectual, a philosopher, uh, and I also teach. I have my own school online, the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts. And I founded that about two years ago as an alternative institution to academe, which I think is, is corrupt and degenerate. I have many friends who are academics, and they tell me, good thing you made the right decision staying out of academe because it's a mess. Mm -hmm. um, I have, there's a professor who every now and then interviews me and we talk about civilization and history uh, and he'll send me the video and then tell me, no, you have to take that part down. I, I shouldn't have said that thing that because I'll get in trouble. So I have to take that down and, and re-edit it. And it's like, you have to watch every word you say. Um, I'd rather just sit down and say whatever I want to say. And, you know, I, I have no interest in that. So, and I've written 30 books, um, some of it poetry, a lot of it cultural criticism on everything from graphic novels uh, to movies uh, to ancient civilization, uh, Sumer, uh, Egypt, um, all kinds of stuff. My mind's just everywhere, uh, all over the place. And I'm currently working on three or four books simultaneously. So, um, yeah, one's a novel and then another is a major work trying to synthesize all my findings over the years in uh, doing occult research, talking mm -hmm. to mediums, uh, reading about hypnotic regression, Michael Newton's books are the best for that. And uh, reading about near-death experiences. Also, I binge watch people on YouTube describing their near-death experiences. And um, so I'm slowly piecing together a, a cosmology that I think is pretty accurate. It's, it's, pretty, it's about as close as a person incarnate is going to get or that they're going to allow any of us to get um, to, to the big picture. So I'm synthesizing all of that and putting it out into, that, that in itself will be three volumes, a, a trilogy wow. there. The Origins and Evolution of the Human Soul is what it's wow. called. So, Have um, you read um, uh, The Holographic Universe by Michael mm -hmm. Talbot? That was Absolutely. my, yeah, 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 and Chloe's read that too, and I think that oh, yeah. we've talked, <laughs> we've talked enough about, about it. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the first book I read, it came out in the 80s when I was in college that I read that opened me up to the whole woo-woo universe, you yeah. know, the whole... Wait a minute, there's something. I mean, the, the first intuition I ever had of, of that was when I was 16 and we would take LSD and go out into the desert in North Phoenix. And I remember looking up at the stars. And at this point, I, I had no culture, no education whatsoever growing up uh, in shopping mall 80s Phoenix, uh, totally culturally deprived, never had a philosophical thought in my life. I'd grown up reading Stephen King novels and that sort of thing. And then here I am out in the desert and, and it looks like the sky's alive. But somehow yeah. I'm looking at it and the, the stars are watching me and I'm realizing that. And it's like the first philosophical thought I ever had that this isn't real. What we're seeing here and experience is we think it's real, but it's an illusion. Or you might say it's real insofar as it goes, but it's concealing a much larger reality that's not visible to our five senses because we're using these monkey bodies right now that have evolved uh, that our souls spotted as a likely prospect for evolving intelligence, self-conscious awareness, which in self-conscious awareness is a level of intelligence that moves from the, the mineral awareness to the plant awareness to the animal awareness. None of those, all of those have varying degrees of consciousness, even the, the minerals do. Hmm. Uh, but only human beings have self-aware consciousness. We're the only creatures who know we're aware and know that we know that we're mm -hmm. aware. Mm -hmm. So it's reflexive. And that's what leads to philosophy in the higher mind, thinking about those things. But all of this was deliberate. It was, you know, it was all planned uh, with our guides in our spiritual groups in the other world. Um, so everything is, you know, it's, everything happens for a reason. But um, anyhow, I, I guess we're still on me introducing myself. But that would be, I guess that's a long version of it. Uh, yeah. But whatever you want to talk about, it's up, up to you. Please. 
Yeah, I'm particularly interested in your journey um, with mediums. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think you've mentioned in one of your videos that you visited a lot of mediums. Uh, what what started you down that path? Mm -hmm. Visited on the telephone. Or yes, uh, <laughs> talked with. It, it can all be yeah. done over the over the phone, as yeah. I realized. Because I, I think uh, originally I went to a medium in, uh, in person way back. Uh, probably 15 years ago in Phoenix, just out of curiosity. And I came away disappointed. Um, you know, I paid her all this money and she just ended up spouting all these new age cliches to me. Mm, and that put yeah. a bad taste in my mouth for mediums. Uh, so years went by and um, as far as I knew, I'd, I'd already been watching, binge watching near death experience videos on YouTube. So I'd already figured out that the soul reincarnates and does survive the death of the body. Um, and I had been watching medium videos, watching this uh, channeling Eric, watching them interview dead celebrities and so forth. So I was pretty convinced it was real. And then my mom died. And then so, and uh, she died under circumstances that made my brother and I feel very guilty. Um, so I said, you know, I, we could use a medium to talk to her. Apparently that's what they're there for. And he's like, all right, well, fine. Um, so we sat down and now my, uh, her mother died four days later. Wow. And um, the I, didn't, I didn't know my mother's mother. Oh, wow. She was already dying of Alzheimer's. So okay. it wasn't a surprise, but the timing was interesting. Yeah. So I get on the phone with the medium um, and I say, yeah, my mom's died and uh, we'd like to talk to her. And she said, you got to give her a couple of weeks when they get over there to get oriented. Um, and then we can talk to her. She's here right now. If you want to ask a question, uh, I forget what I said, but so we come back two weeks later uh, and we get on the phone. Uh, we've got it on speakerphone. My brother and I are sitting there and she says, oh, your grandmother's here too. And I didn't tell her anything about my grandmother passing. She's like, oh yeah, she, they went out together. Uh, they intended it that way because they're like the Bobsy twins. You know, they can't get enough of each other. Just their souls are just tied together. Wow. And their whole life relationship was rocky. It was mommy dearest. <laughs> yeah. It was rocky. But nonetheless, when you have karmic ties with people, uh, it's deeper than pain. It, it goes way deeper than, than pain. The mm -hmm. karmic ties with, with other people. Go, go ahead. This is just a quick interjection, but do you know any, like, did your mother and your grandmother have any uh, nodal sinistry going on? I don't know. I never did check. Okay. Um, that would be interesting to, to check, yeah. Um, I'm sure they did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know why that never occurred to me. But anyhow, so we talked to the medium for an hour, and it, it was mom. There was no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. She knew all kinds of personal details about our lives that the medium could not have known. Mm -hmm. So we walked away um, feeling reassured. Everything was fine. Uh, everything went according to plan for her death. And then so I guess it was just a couple months after that that I had, since I had been watching this channel, cha uh, channeling Eric, and watching him and his mother, he's a dead kid who committed suicide uh, about the age of 20, and... Uh, he, um, they will get a medium and Eric can then, because some mediums don't have the ability to uh, grab famous people out of the ether. Most of them can only get your relatives, people who have blood ties to you, because um, I've asked several mediums if they could do it. And they usually say no. But because this dead kid is there as an anchor, he can go get anyone you want. Oh, wow. So that's the advantage with having him as another medium, let's say. Yeah, the medium um, to the medium. Yeah, so then I, th I thought, well, if they can talk to you know Elvis Presley and the Buddha, why can't I talk to my favorite philosophers like Nietzsche? I bet nobody's ever done that, and as far as I know, no one ever has. Yeah. <laughs> talk to Nietzsche yeah. and Schopenhauer and Joseph Campbell and Marshall McLuhan and Gene Gebser and Oswald Spengler. We, we talked about seven of them, um, and that was a that was a grand old time. Yeah, I used a medium from India, Shruti Campbell. Uh, and those videos are still up on YouTube for anyone who wants cool. to watch them. They're, they're yeah. still there. They were a great deal of fun. Yeah, um, super interested in what that process looks like when you interview somebody from the other side. Um, what questions do you ask? Well, watch the videos. Okay. <laughs> They're yeah. on there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, just questions that I, you know, from having read their books that I wanted clarification mm -hmm. on this point or that point. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, and there are all these little things where I know it's the right person. Like, for instance, uh, when we got Schopenhauer on, um, you know who Schopenhauer was and what he had, his cranky disposition. He was a misogynist, <laughs> yes. basically a miss everythingist. Yeah, um, I miss the first, yeah. And uh, so we get him on, and she goes, he doesn't really want to do the interview, but he says he'll do it anyway, just as a favor. And I said, we've got the right guy. 
we've got the right guy. <laughs> He's the only one who was like, eh, all right, whatever. Uh, so that's, that was fun. And uh, it was, I asked uh, Joseph Campbell, because he was an atheist too, uh, when he died, I said, uh, so Joe, uh, when, you, when you passed over, was it a surprise to you? Uh, were, were you surprised? And he goes, I sure was. And that's exactly his speech mannerisms, if you watch the Bill Moyers uh, thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we had a lot of fun. So I did that, and then I, I sort of let that go, just as a, a what-if experiment, put the videos up on YouTube. Um, and, then, um, and then my girlfriend committed suicide. And so that was a serious situation all of a sudden. Um, I had met her in 2016, and I remember looking at her astro chart and saying to her, you know, in three years, just as this is a heads up, in three years you've got Pluto crossing over your natal Saturn. You're going to have a rough three years. Three years later, 2019 rolls around and she puts a bullet through her head. And at the same time, I've got Pluto squaring my Saturn at the exact same time. So it was the worst three years of my life. But uh, fortunately, I had the medium paradigm in place. So I was able to use various mediums to talk to her for the next couple of years. But all that did was just, it was just degenerated into more fighting. You know, just it's the same fights we've been having through many lifetimes over and over again. Uh, usually she'll show up as, as some temptress. I cheat on my wife or whatever. It's usually a, a very tawdry thing over and over and over again. She's always the other woman and it always leads to chaos and, and craziness. So there's a strong karmic tie there. Um, after two years, I got to a point where I can't talk to her anymore. So I, I have to close the door and just tell her goodbye. I can't talk to you anymore or I'll never heal. Um, I have to move on. And then it took about one more year after that for me to feel okay. And that was the full Sat Pluto square Saturn three years. I knew it, I, it was February of, uh, what was it, last year or the February before that. I knew that the grief would lift and I'd be okay. And it was right on time. It was mm. right on time. And Do plus Chiron, which brings healing energy. Chiron was returning and it was landing right on that same spot where Saturn is bringing mm. all this healing, regenerative mm. energy. So... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, in regards to your girlfriend and then saying like shutting the door because of those problems, you won't be able to heal. Are you afraid that in a next life you'll have to encounter her again? Oh, it's a, it's a certainty. Resolved? It's an absolute certainty. No, they have not been resolved. Mm -hmm. um, no. I even asked her, I said, how are we doing? Uh, looking back over our incarnations because you have all the memories, I don't. And she said, not so well. Uh, <laughs> not so well. This is going to go on for a while, apparently. So, yeah, that's the way it is. Souls look at things differently on the other side. They look at yeah. things like that as opportunities for growth. And um, they just see life differently. They, they, they're they avid to incarnate on this planet. There's a reason why, A, the sex drive is so high, and B, why there's so many people on the planet. There's a lot of souls want to get down mm. here because... The Earth is one of the most difficult places in the entire universe to incarnate. Every galaxy has its own, what you might say, angel being. Um, I was reading the ray sessions where they were channeling these ray beings. And the, these are beings who are on a non-material plane associated with Venus, with the planet Venus, hmm. the sixth density. They've already evolved out of their physical forms. So apparently there was life on Venus for a while. Uh, and now they are finding out, indeed, that there were oceans on Venus and that its atmosphere was not always a, a runaway CO2 atmosphere right. the way it is now. And uh, we know that there was life on Mars as well. So it looks like there was life simultaneously on all three of these planets, but the other two lost out. However, uh, once the physical plane disappears as an opportunity for incarnation, um, there are still other planes, non-material right. planes, through which beings can evolve. So these ray beings... Um, uh, they interviewed them back in the 1980s. The medium was Carla Ruckert, um, and her husband was a scientist, uh, physics guy. Uh, and they sat down and they transcribed uh, as she was channeling these beings. And it's really weird. You can tell as you're reading the transcripts that they're not human because they don't have a sense of humor. And it's a little like ha having a conversation with Spock. Very yeah. logical, very articulate, very clear, um, nothing hard to understand. Uh, except insofar as they'll explain, you know, difficult subject matter, like the subtle energy planes. Um, yeah, and so um, what was I getting to with them? That um, Incarnating on the earth. To yeah, because, oh, right, right, right. And each galaxy then has its own, what they call is a, is a logos, 
which I take it to mean angel, it's the same thing. So each Milky Way has its own logos being uh, that provides the theme for that galaxy. And our theme for the Milky Way galaxy is the dichotomy between fear and love. That's the struggle. Within this galaxy, uh, the Earth is the hardest planet to incarnate on, the toughest one, and therefore the most popular. Mm. Um, souls mm. want to get, this is the K2 of evolution. If you're already down here, it's already an achievement that you're just sitting there. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it is. Um, a lot of times I recall near-death experience of people saying that a lot of times after a really rough life and they make the crossing, there, there might be a round of applause for them when they get over there. There very often is. Um, you know, what we see is, oh, poor me, what a shitty life. They see is, wow, you, this person is moving along. Um, mm-hmm. Just like if you, want, if you want to develop your muscles, you lift weights. If you want to develop spiritually, you choose tough lifetimes. Now, the people who choose easy lifetimes, celebrities and porn stars and whatever you want, whatever the category is, these are people who are, A, either on a vacation because they've just come out of a series of particularly difficult lives and they want an easy one, or they are souls who are still immature, they're young, they're newborns, and they're, it's a, for them, for younger newborn souls, it's all about the body. We well, look at this, I'm in this body, look at all these crazy things you can do with this body, bungee jumping and uh, porn and all this insane stuff you can do. But then you get to a point along where you're about midway in your incarnational process and you're sort of no longer so much addicted to the senses. And that also means resorting to violence to solve your problems. Um, you have to get past that to a point where you're about midway and you're no longer resorting to violence to solve your problems. So the ray beings put it this way. Think of the Aries Libra axis. Uh, I added the Aries Libra axis because mm-hmm. it's the same thing as what they're saying that, that service to self versus service to others. Mm-hmm. You can think of Libra as one on one. Let's say Aries is the self. Um, in the early incarnations, it's all about me, 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 me. It's all about the Aries self. Mm-hmm. Me, my body, with the stuff, money, love, wealth, everything. And then gradually it tilts. So by the time you're about midway in your incarnations, you're aware that it isn't just about you anymore. Other people are in pain. Sure. Other people are suffering too. Uh, you think more about other people, but it, you still have to have a career, right? And to, to have some ego achievements. But then in the later incarnations, it'll tilt toward service to others almost exclusively. And that's when you'll get the Jesus Christ, the Rudolf Steiner, the Sri Aurobindo, uh, guys like that who do nothing but think about other yeah. people. That's just the natural art, morphology of the spiritual process. That's, that's how okay. it works over time. It, the metaphor that's coming to my head is like, um, it's like an obstacle course and like choosing, like earth is like the yeah. ultimate like playground obstacle course. Absolutely. Or like a military training yeah. course, like the yeah. army crawl in and stuff. Mm-hmm. So those Venetian beings that are mm. like ray beings, how do they experience pain? Do they not really experience pain? <clears throat> I think they're beyond it at this point. Uh, I think they say... So they say that there are these eight densities, and they map onto the seven chakras. It's just that mm-hmm. um, the eighth density is, a, is like a, uh, it's an octave. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got the seven densities. The first density is the mineral world. Uh, it's just purely material. The second density is the plant world. And then the third density is the animal world. And the fourth density on the physical plane is uh, self-conscious awareness, uh, which humans have achieved. But there is another density, a non-material plane of the fourth density where they can still feel pain, uh, but it's no longer, they're no longer involved in a material world. Um, and then there's a fifth density and they are at sixth density. They say they've evolved up and they're looking forward to evolving up to seventh density. And those basically have the same symbolism as the upper chakras. They, they just get mm-hmm. more spiritually refined as you ascend up the, the de- through the cosmic densities. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is true psychologically uh, and it is true cosmologically and it's also true in terms of the model of civilization you move from civilization with the tribe which is all about sort of me 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 my group and then you move up to larger groups with villages which is building one-on-one social relations and then the third to the development of states and cities which really does involve that third chakra the mind poor chakra the will to power chakra anytime you have a civilization you're it's going to be struggle for power struggle for power struggle for power and then the fourth density, the heart chakra is activated through compassion. Mm. That's when the, the mm. heart chakra awakens. It's green ray energy, healing energy, and that's when you're on the way up uh, through your spiritual evolution. Mm. And we all go through this naturally, normally, uh, but becoming conscious of the process accelerates it because you can, 
once you become aware that, hey, what I do matters, every decision I make matters, uh, whether I give uh, the change in my pocket to the guy on the quarter, it actually does matter. Uh, and it does count in your favor. Mm -hmm. There was a guy uh, who was under regressive hypnosis who remembered when he was talking to his guides and they had a life review. The first thing you do when you get over there is greet your loved ones, of course, uh, but then you, you, your elders want to talk to you and they assemble a little council and you hover sort of before them uh, with your guide on your left side and uh, you go through the life review. So you review the, everything that happens to you is recorded in the ether, everything. Every single thing that happens is recorded in the cosmic Akashic record. So they access that and then you go through your life and you be the judge of whether you think you did good or bad. And then uh, this one guy, so he was nervous and uh, he was like touting his ego achievements and they're like, we're not interested in that. Do you remember the bus stop? Mm -hmm. He was like, the bus mm -hmm. stop, what are you talking about? Do you remember the girl who was crying on the bus stop? And all of a sudden he's like, oh yeah, I was on my way to work, I had a cup of coffee, um, it was the depression and she was crying and I just sat down with her until she stopped crying and then I, and then I left and he and the the elders say that's what we're interested in hmm. Hmm. so that's what they're after so every you know knowing that having that paradigm means that every every decision you make counts is being yeah. observed is being watched not to be paranoid because they're entirely benevolent and non-judgmental our guides because each one of us is assigned to a soul group of anywhere from five to 20 souls. My group is large, it's like 25. Um, and you keep reincarnating in groups. That's how it works. Your friends are not an accident. Your enemies are not an accident. Uh, and I asked this question recently about rock bands. I thought, well, it's, that must, they, they must be from the same soul group. So I asked my medium and she said, yes, they are. They're all from the <laughs> same soul group. That's why they have these weird ties yeah um, yeah and uh, so we incarnate in these groups um, but then we're like so we're like students in a classroom and the teacher is the guide for the group okay. and it might be one two three ours has four so it just depends on and, and the guides too and where they're at with their evolution and so they are the teachers of the classroom and they supervise everything so there's those are the ones who are observing you at all times mm. these, these guide beings we used to call them guardian angels Rudolf Steiner made the mistake of calling them angels, um, but he was saying each one of us has a personal guardian that watches over us. What he really meant was these are guides. Okay. They're not angels because these are different from angels because guides are humans. They are people, they're souls who have made it through most of their incarnations and they're nearing the, the completion okay. point. So yeah. now they can help other people. Like a so, bodhisattva? Sort of, yeah. Sort of yeah. kind of the same concept as a bodhisattva. Right. They help out um, until they're... Uh, decide they're done with their incarnations and then they move up to ascended masters and then they, they just organize things on the other side. Mm. Um, but yeah, everything you do is being observed, uh, absolutely everything and recorded. Um, and you'll feel it when the life re review plays it all back in front of you, um, you experience. And the thing is uh, about this too, is that nobody gets away with anything. We <laughs> say, you know, oh, what that serial killer guy, how come he get he gets to kill 20 people for 20 years and nobody catches him. Well, guess what? He has to come back as a victim. So yeah. that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. It all comes out in the wash. You get over there in the life review and what happens is you experience the pain that you've caused other people from their point of view mm -hmm. in their skin. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very painful and it's the least looked forward to part of the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of souls worry about it and complain about it, but it's really the only hard part once you're on the other side to deal with. Um, and then from that point, you have to start making decisions about reincarnation. And of course, if you were addicted to violence, then you, by the law of karmic balancing, you have to come back as the victim of violence. That's just the way it works. The soul requires that homeostatic completion. Right. And it know? sounds to me like a, like a lot of the lunar nodes, like, I mean, yes. you, you have to have that balance between Absolutely. the south and the north node. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, there's always the 180 degree. The nodes opposition. will record that. It'll yeah. either flip 180 or it'll flip 90 degrees. Oh, interesting. Yeah, my last one flipped. Uh, was it 90 degrees? No, the last one was 180. When I was a, my great grandfather, his nodes are in the same spot in Aries um, and Libra. Only they're flipped. My north node is his south node, okay. and he was a, a surgeon, so he was a physician. So I take it he wanted to come back as a metaphysician, which is what happened when the karma flipped. So just for um, I can't context. do anything with my hands this time around. Oh, interesting. Been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. 
just for extra context for whoever watches this, um, the the lunar nodes. I'll just like to give some context. Context. Lunar nodes are the north and the south node, which are points on the ecliptic, and they're not celestial bodies. They're not like planets or anything. The north node, uh, the the natal north node placement represents where you're going in this lifetime, where you are, uh, the reason why you've incarnated in this lifetime. The south node, which is always 180 degrees away, opposite the wheel, is what you're releasing and where you have been in past mm -hmm. lives. And so, and so I can see that kind of like balance, the, the karmic retribution of like what you have in this incarnation, you're going to need to oppose in the next, or release yeah. and, and have find some karmic balance uh, opposition. But can you talk right. a little bit about but the 90 degrees? if it degrees? just keeps flipping back and forth, then yeah. it won't change yeah. from Aries to Libra. So every now and then it has to go 90 degrees okay, in order yeah. to get, get to a different zone. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because the incarnation before that one as the Civil War general guy that I was, uh, was a 90 degree flip. Because I have his chart, I have my great grandfather's chart, and I could, so I can compare them. Um, so yeah, it was a 90 degree flip in that case. So it's always, so mm -hmm. the karmic balance is always finding itself on this like grand cross axis. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. And then when do you like make a shift? I wonder if you have thoughts on like, when would you make a shift from like, cause right now my natal North node is in Capricorn. So that would suggest that I've been going through this Aries, Libra, Capricorn, Cancer. Yeah. So it'll have shift. to shift. There'll and be so a tilt. I, I wonder if it will tilt toward Aquarius or back towards Sagittarius, like. Um, well, there's no way to know that. Okay, you, only okay. your soul would know that. Yeah. Once you get over there, then you'll have a better view of what's going on. Our higher selves do remain behind, uh, but they go they go dormant. But you can still you can still talk to them. Some of the dead philosophers I talked to had incarnations running concurrently on the earth, so you can still talk to them. It's just that they can't engage in activities over there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of activities. Uh, they, they're just as busy as we are down here. Mm -hmm. uh, they take classes on, let's say, mm -hmm. how to design a fish. Let's say you want to learn how to manipulate the genes to create a mutation. That's very advanced, though. I mean, <laughs> Interesting. You, you start out with rocks. They, they you start oh, out with cool. rocks. And so, yeah, so everything that's created on the physical world has been already thought out and created by non-incarnate beings. So that view is correct. That view that turns out to be correct. Um, there's nothing random or accidental. Um, yeah, or they, they engage in recreation, dance. They do have sex as well, mm -hmm. also. Uh, in that case, it's not for reproduction. I got curious about this. I said, so what do they do? And just rub up against each other. <laughs> it's a full body orgasm instead of a genital orgasm. Mm -hmm. It's much more intense. Uh, but it, over there, it's like priority number 12. Okay. Whereas down here, it's like priority number two, right? After food first, mm -hmm. you know, food and then sex. Um, yeah, so there's that. And uh, they do all dances and mm. they'll organize events. And they do all kinds of things. But when you're incarnate, that energy uh, is shut off. So you're just focused on that lifetime down on the planet here below. Um, so your higher self is there and it's observing and watching you. And I have not yet had the courage to ask questions of my higher self to a medium. It seems a little weird to me. I don't know, hmm. or maybe like cheating. So, oh, <laughs> so yeah, far I yeah. haven't. Could you ask my higher self why <laughs> this shit's happening right now? Um, I don't know, I don't wanna do that. But I have talked to, the, to my group's guides. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They've been very friendly. Uh, yeah. Very helpful. Uh, like, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> when it comes to things like suicide or like when you choose choose to end your life here on Earth, are there negative ramifications on the other side or not? Yes really? and no. There's no negative ramic ramifications in the sense of a punishment. There's nothing like that. The Catholics have that wrong. They have a lot wrong. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there is a kind of quarantine. You'll be set aside for a while. By yourself in a beautiful meadow or whatever the setting is that you want um, anything that you imagine you can make real it's just mm -hmm. like the holodeck you know from Star Trek. Yeah. same oh, yeah. concept uh, whatever you want to be real will be real uh, but you're put aside uh, just to the only communication you have is with your group's guides that's it for a while and it seems like my girlfriend was in that kind of purgatory ether for about two years and then I noticed that she was withdrawing um, she was less and less available to me for the mediums because uh, mm -hmm. the medium would say, well, she used to be 75% here and 25% there, but now it's like 50-50. She's slowly pulling away. I realized that she was socializing and that was it. Mm -hmm. So that's really it. But the problem is with suicide is that um, it disappoints them, the, the guides, because they've gone to the trouble 
of mapping this lifetime out with you before you incarnated, you agreed to all the hard stuff. You've already mm -hmm. agreed to it. It's already going to happen. So this has all been planned out and it's like, um, you know, it's like being a bad sport. Yeah. It's like, you know, well, I don't want to play this game if you're going to win. You know, it's that kind of attitude yeah. uh, that they don't want. Um, so it disappoints them, but they're gentle and they're, they're non-judgmental and they'll say, it's fine. Um, everybody does it eventually. Uh, I have two or three times now. Uh, my dead girlfriend said she had done it five or six times. Um, so everybody does it at some point, but it, it gets you, it doesn't get you anywhere because whatever the problem was that you were having, probably under a Saturn Pluto transit, mm -hmm. um, you have to, you know, it has to come back because you didn't successfully pass the test. So mm. it'll, it'll come back. You were also talking about like Christ-like figures who achieve a certain point where they start caring about the others around them yes. in like a global context or right. all, also Rudolf Steiner. Um, how do you know, have you spoken to a medium about this? Like, how do you know if you're caring about people or if it's like sheer solipsism or in the, like the stuff you care about, the stuff you think about, oh, this is good for the world. How do you know if it's good for the world or if it's doesn't just... matter. The world doesn't matter. What matters are your personal relations, your family mm -hmm. members, your friends, your lovers, your enemies. That's where the decisions come in, right there. It's How do you really treat personal. these people? Do you, yes, do you forgive them for stabbing you in the back or whatever it was? Um, that's where the decisions are made, uh, where you start consciously thinking, am I just, just, am I talking about myself too much or maybe I'll, I should listen? Um, the, I just watched uh, the Steve Jobs movie. Jobs fascinates me uh, mm -hmm. to quite a great degree. And he had this problem where he was kind of autistic. He would just go on and on and on. And he's got this little girl, his daughter named Lisa, that uh, he's not being a proper father. First of all, he won't even admit to being the father. But then even when we're, they're in the same room, he's going on and on about all of his computer stuff. And his assistant says, try asking her what she likes and the things that interest her. He's like, okay, I'll try. So he does it. He starts asking her about what went on in school. And it changes the relationship. So mm -hmm. it's like that. Mm -hmm. It's just these simple little decisions that you make that you don't <coughs> think matter, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve Jobs is a Pisces, right? I can't remember. I think he was. Uh, I think so. That sounds right. Yeah. And also, <coughs> uh, obviously, like Rudolf Steiner influences a lot of your uh, work and stuff. Yes. You said there you agree with him mostly, but there are a few things you don't agree with him at. What are those key things that you key differences you? Well, first of all, he, he missed astrology. Mm -hmm. um, he dismissed it, but you have to consider the context. He, he also didn't like mediums either. You have to consider the context of the middle of the 19th century when mediums and seances were all the rage and table tapping, and he thought mm -hmm. it was a vulgarization, yeah. like the way we would think of Shirley MacLaine, uh, vulgarizing the new age, that kind of thing. So he just lumped all that together as, as theosophical vo vulgarization. Um, so he, but he did miss that. He missed both of those avenues. And when I asked him, uh, when I interviewed him using a medium uh, about astrology, he said, yeah, I, I missed it. I missed the boat. And he's, he's like, now I'm ready to learn about it. Um, which is odd because he's, the planets mean such a great deal for him. Yeah, because yeah. for him, uh, the planets are colonies of spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. That's what each one of them is. They have these spiritual beings assigned to them. Now I always took that as a metaphor. I thought, well, he's just being pretty and poetic. Until I encountered this guy who had a near-death experience, and he was out of his body, his guide was with him, and they were going, zipping through our solar system, because he pointed at a star, and he said, I'm going to visit that star, just randomly, let's go. So they're going, and as they're going past our planets, he says, hey, there's cities on these planets. How come I can't see that when I'm in my body? And he says, because you're not tuned to the right frequency. Now, once you're out of your body, you're at a higher frequency, so now you can perceive the colonies of spiritual beings. Rudolf Steiner nailed it once again that mm. he gets it right. He was the first one talking about the life review. Long before Raymond mm. Moody in the 70s came along and wrote Life After Life, he was already in the 1910s and 20s talking about the life review. is the first thing that happens where you experience other people's pain and, and you go through your life review. How could he have known these things if he wasn't clairvoyant? There's no other possible mm. explanation. Mm. He did have mediumistic abilities himself. Um, so... Um, some other things that I don't care for is the uh, the baggage having to do with Atlantis uh, because I think it, it makes his historic, his model as it moves through the civilizations a bit odd. 
hmm. and not right uh, because he moves from Lemuria and Atlantis to then around 10,000 BC. You know, let's say it's uh, 7,000 something, maybe 7225, that the early version of uh, India comes into being. Now, India in 7,000 BC is just a bunch of goat herders. There's right. no, there's nothing there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the model, the historical model, has problems because yeah. it follows. Uh, the procession of the equinoxes, which moves right. every 2,000 years, so he's got a new civilization coming in. It's a little mechanical. It's a little clunky. Mm -hmm. um, although I understand the need for elegance, and the same thing with his angelology. The problem there is, uh, I've talked to mediums, that yes, there are angels, but there's no hierarchy of them. They're, not, they, they're assigned to specific tasks, mm -hmm. like this galaxy or that galaxy is going to be, that, that angel being will organize that, that one or this one. So they have different tasks, but there's no hierarchy where you move from cherubim, seraphim, thrones, and on down. It doesn't work that way. So that, but it's a way you have to organize the information somehow. So that's a Christian carryover that chain of being, and then as he gets down through the nine, and the lowest rank is what he calls the angels, the angela, the angels proper, and these are uh, each of one is assigned to one of us. Well, they're not angels. He's talking about guides. He's got he's got it right. It's just that it's guides, not angels, that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Our guides are not angels. So, but there are angel beings, and these are beings that have never incarnated before. Mm -hmm. They don't incarnate. That's not what they do. They, uh, they're in charge of macrocosmic mm -hmm. constructive projects, projects and processes, building galaxies and stars and things like that, the big stuff. So. I wonder if, uh, in your interview with Rudolf Steiner, or also just your own thought, like, do you think mm -hmm. that he um, would come back to maybe integrate astrology, integrate like different yeah, kinds of cosmology. It's probable. Yeah. We, have, we have a friend who thinks that he's Rudolf Steiner incarnate, reincarnated. But I don't know, he hasn't gone through like a huge... Well, know, we can solve that. We yeah, can talk to yeah. a medium. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, we should. And end that right quick. Yeah, uh, because yeah. He, he has also like become very interested in astrology in from knowing us. And he, he uh, <clears throat> sent me a message recently where he was like, I'm ready to learn. And, okay. um, and, and yeah, and he thinks that he's Steiner. So right. I don't know, well, we can, yeah. yeah. He's not disappointed if he finds out otherwise. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I'm not saying that he isn't because as I say, you can yeah. have a, an incarnation running, still talk to the person's higher self. Uh, sure. Yeah. But I think, I, I think I might've asked him if he had an incarnation going and he said yes, hmm. but I don't remember what it was. Wow. I yeah, I, I was curious about, so you, you go to mediums to learn about your past lives. Mm -hmm. Um, do you ever have an intuition about a historical figure or somebody from the past and believe like I, this may be one of my past incarnations and you go to a medium to confirm that no. or, um, mm -mm. do you just go to a medium and it's they been tell by you? accident every single time oh, wow. and it started with, um, talking to mediums about, uh, and they would just drop, I was asking about previous incarnations I'd had with my girlfriend. That was all that mm -hmm. I was doing. So we were going through those, most of which are anonymous. And then at some point, somebody muttered something about me being a, a Civil War general. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that much about the Civil War, so I, I, it, I just let it go past me. But then at one point, I, I decided, uh, after a couple of years into the process, I, I asked the question most people want to know. I said, so was I ever anybody famous then? Mm -hmm. uh, this was about a year and a half ago. And... Uh, she said, uh, she goes, well, you were this philosopher in the time of Queen Elizabeth who kept getting into trouble and he journeyed to the continent and then he came back and fell out of favor. She couldn't retrieve the name because for some odd reason, names don't come through easily. Sometimes mm. they do, sometimes mm. they don't. Um, and so I wondered, I, th I thought, well, it can't be Francis Bacon because Steiner said that Bacon was the reincarnation of Harun al-Rashid, the, the great Baghdad uh, guy. And there, Britain's not known for producing philosophers. It's a very pragmatic society. Who was that? What was there, a John D guy? So I looked him up, and his biography matched exactly what she said. Mm -hmm. So next time I got back with her, I said, was it John D? And she goes, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's it, exactly. Um, now, as far as I'm concerned, if, if one medium says that, it's not true until two other mediums have said the same thing, totally independently. Right. So I can right. get corroboration. And now I'm up to like seven. That they okay. all agreed that it was John D. They're all, yeah, that was a big deal for you, that incarnation. I'm like, you're telling me, the guy intimidates me <laughs> looking at his uh, biography. Uh, and he was a left brain philosopher, and I came back as a right brain philosopher. But, mm. uh, but he incarnated after that incarnation as a woman, a natural scientist, a, a biologist in Germany in the 17th century, hmm. Maria Sibylla Marion. 
um, who was famous for her illustrations, her drawings of insects. She was fascinated with nature. Um, so there again, you can see the karma switching from a, a much more transcendental masculinist up there mind to a more embedded earth mother down here mm. mind that's embedded in, in where the, the spirituality comes from living things. Uh, so you can see the flip. In, in addition to having been a womanizer, um, so he has to come back and, and be a woman who, uh, she had children. Then he reincarnated as one of his granddaughters. I don't know which one. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. How many incarnations on average does a person go through? Well, I asked, uh, uh, and the mediums have said, in my case, roughly it's been about 800 so wow. far. But I've heard them talk about incarnations as far back as the Paleolithic. Um, so it must have started somewhere in there. So it's it's been so eight hundred incarnations over thirty thousand or forty thousand years. The thing is, they accelerate because the population has grown, and grown and grown. So there's more and more opportunities to accelerate the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Michael Newton was the psychiatrist who was talking about this when he was putting his patients up under uh, re regressive hypnosis, and uh, he realized that they were incarnating by now about once a century. And that's what it seems to be as we hit European civilization and we start figuring out nature and how to control it and prevent famine and, and so the population rises. And so people incarnate more and more frequently and accelerates the process. So I, I, she said, I'm about midway through the process. So 800 means another 800 more. I'm guessing it's probably 2,000 roughly for each of us. Wow. Roughly, give or take. Uh, oh, depends. That's fascinating. Yeah. You also mm -hmm. talk about... Uh, these people who are like legitimate, not people, but these things that are legitimately angels and they do the macrocosmic construction yeah. stuff. You also talk a lot about how there is like, um, you know, Big Bang and then there's like destruction, not destruction, but like um, it fall, not falls apart and then it comes back again. It's gone on forever. We can't comprehend that. How do these like macrocosmic beings decide when to... I don't know, collapse and then restart and then collapse and restart. Well, they're carrying out the, the intentions of the God being. So the God being, whatever it is, uh, and many people under near death uh, or under uh, hypnosis rather have, have remembered being born yeah. as a soul from the God energy. Uh, several accounts of it. And they all say the same thing. All of a sudden I was just there uh, and there was this crackling like purple humming energy source thing. Uh, that was very mysterious, but I take it that that's just the nucleus of the whole project. That's where all the thoughts are coming from. And the being probably created angels specifically to carry out its wishes on the, for physical uh, transformations. So they know because the God being knows and tells them when, when it's time. And so, yeah, so that's the cosmology that I've gotten from listening to mediums mm -hmm. uh, and also the near-death experiences and also regressive hypnosis uh, patients is that uh, it's, it's like a giant heart. It's, yeah. Big bang, it expands, Breathing. and eventually it collapses, big crunch. Doesn't matter for the souls. We worry about, oh, well, one day the sun's going to burn up the earth and there's not going to be, oh, big. souls don't care. They're, right, right. they're in another dimension. Yeah. Just, it's just that opportunity is closed. And there's plenty of other planets yeah. with life possibilities on yeah. them for incarnation. Uh, so, yeah, that is, I guess, how it works. It's just, it's been going on forever. And it's a mystery, of course. There's no way for us to understand uh, how could this be going on forever. And every, with every Big Bang, it's a different theme for the creation. That, And this time, the theme is humans, human beings. With a they have a different kind of consciousness, a very individualized sort of consciousness. Each soul that is created has its own fingerprint. You might say its own mm. core frequency of vibration that is unique to that particular soul. Except when, in the case of twin flames to use a, a new age word. Um, twin flames are a soul that, like mitosis, it splits into two separate entities. So your twin flame is the only other being in the universe that has the exact same core vibrational frequency that you have, which is why, and this was with, with my girlfriend who committed suicide, this is what I learned about her and I, that we're twin flames, we're tuned into each other. And um, so when that happens, you, the incarnations, and it's not a romantic thing at all because the incarnations with twin flames are usually very, very painful, mm -hmm. very difficult. Um, it's, there's nothing romantic about it. Soulmates are what everybody thinks of when they're thinking. That's a different thing. A soulmate is just a partner that you've had across many lifetimes that you may enjoy being in a marriage relationship with or a brother-sister thing mm -hmm. or whatever. 
Um, that's not twin flames. That's a different thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, so humans are, are unique. We have these unique individual fi energetic fingerprints and each one of us is different. Um, and each one of us carries that core frequency vibration with us through all the different lifetimes, no matter how different they are, you will find a running theme through there. And I think one of the reasons why I made that karmic autobiography and put it on YouTube was so people could see that there's a theme there. The incarnations are not random. Um, there, there's a theme. It seems like um, studying, studying history and studying astrology together, it seems like the it's it's just very obvious that there's this like expansion contraction like that seems like the framework of this current paradigm or not not even a paradigm it seems bigger than a paradigm i guess it just yeah. seems like it's the spiritual that's the spiritual purpose of like this galactic era or something like you have these these cycles of um and it seems like more and more people are coming to to learn that i mean spangler you know sort of talks about cyclical historical patterns um, you have that with, uh, well, the fourth turning was the book that came out 30 years ago at this point that is talking about that. Um, people are starting to, I think that the astrology itself maybe had a contraction up until the new age mm -hmm. and then yeah. now it's sort of bloomed again. And as yeah. people are getting more serious with astrology, they're realizing too, like, oh yeah, there's these cycles, these historical patterns that are just playing out this, this larger, like crisis into a high back into a crisis kind of thing and that just yeah. seems like the pattern that it, it is becoming taken more and more seriously though, yeah. by more and more people because yeah. it fell out of favor during the cosmological transformations of the renaissance and they're finding new planets like uranus in the 18th century and then neptune in the 19th century and then pluto in the early 20th century so obviously the ancients didn't know about these planets so the whole thing must have been wrong well it wasn't wrong it, it wasn't wrong at all it's just that these were new archetypes that astrologers straddling the 19th and 20th century had to figure out the archetypes mm -hmm. by just by applying them and seeing that Pluto surfaces whenever there's a crisis. Pluto's always seems to show sure. up, so they figured it out. Um, so now we know that it works. I don't think anybody knows how it works, and that's what upsets science. Yeah. They don't like yeah. not knowing how something fucking works. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They want to <laughs> know how it works it's... so they can tear, tear it apart. But there's, you can't understand it. We just know that it does, and we can demonstrate that it does. You can right. sit down, look at the transits, and you can compare them, and you'll see that it works. We don't know how it works, but uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't. Yeah. Anecdotally, I just I have this one friend who's an engineering student, and he's constantly, he really uh, wants to understand astrology from this like very scientific perspective, and I just keep telling him it's never going to satisfy you. It's not going to work. It's not going to satisfy you in the way that you're trying Because they're to. trying to understand it as though it were happening on the physical plane, and it's not. It's happening yes. on the etheric, yeah. energetic plane that isn't visible. Yeah. It's yeah. not visible to the five senses, although it can be visible. I have seen it under the influence of psilocybin. Uh, out here, I took psilocybin shortly after my girlfriend died because it was like three months into it, and I thought it would help. Um, and I should have known that I, I knew very well that I was having a Pluto square Saturn transit and that the astrologer Rick Tarnas told me a long time ago, you can tell whether you're going to have a good trip or a bad mm -hmm. trip by where those planets are. Oh my and gosh. I should yeah. have known Saturn Pluto is going to activate the birth matrix. Should have known, but I wasn't thinking. I was just thinking, cool. I've never tried it. Maybe it'll open a new door. <laughs> so we go out here, someplace out here, not that far from here. Uh, Native American. It's all men for this one night. Native American. They've inherited uh, Geronimo's granddaughter's uh, Native American ceremony. And then so twilight comes. There's shamans there. They're doing drumming. The twilight comes. We all get in line and take our grams. Mm -hmm. Now, I asked the guy, uh, Ted is the procurator there, and he's got a little cup full of mushrooms. And I say, Ted, how much should I take for it? Like, I want a really good experience. And he's like, well, five grams it would be like a heroic dose. <laughs> I said, I'll take the five grams. Ted. Put them right here. Because I don't want to walk away feeling like I got gypped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little did I know. And then so as about an hour slowly goes by and we're sitting there. And then I'm starting to feel really, really uneasy. Yeah. Anxious, nervous. And slowly I start, I start thinking, these people are demons, aren't they? They tricked me. They tricked me into coming out here so they could fucking hijack my mind. And, so, and they looked like demons. And I was really flipping out. And I went back to Ted. I was like, Ted, this, this, this is not good here. And he's frantically putting 
drops of something on my tongue to reverse the process. It, oh. do, it does no good. Uh, and then I'm curled up in a fetus, in, in a ball. There's a guy supervising me, fortunately. He's been very patient with me, guiding me through the whole process. But um, the world just suddenly became like a German expressionist painting. <laughs> Everything was distorted. Yeah. It was just warped and distorted. And uh, I just felt like I was going to die. And I, I, I was convinced I was going to die. I was like, I'm going to die right here from these fucking mushrooms. <laughs> and then... Uh, I came out of it slowly. A couple hours later, I started realizing, oh, I turned a corner. Oh, it's like the birth process. you got to go through the canal to get to the relief. There's, here's the relief. So I was able to get up, and I'm walking around. I'm no longer hallucinating. I'm stable, back to consensus reality. Except that my consciousness is still tuned to the subtle energies. And there's another guy having a rough time. We're the only two guys in the group having a, rough, a bad trip. So I go over to see what's going on with him. And he's lying on the ground. There are a couple of shaman guys uh, supervising him. And as I look at him, I can see all his chakras. I can see his astral body. There, there it is. It's glistening and iridescent mm -hmm. and beautiful and geometrically arranged. I'm like, can you guys fucking see this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we see that all the time every time we do these trips. I'm like, this is fucking amazing. I can see this guy's chakras. They're real. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Everybody was like, go away. We're trying to help this guy. <laughs> so... Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're real. They're, yeah. Where do demons fit in all this? Um, that's a good question. A, a lot of people asked Michael Newton, the psychiatrist, that. And his opinion was uh, that there aren't any demons. That there's no actual genuinely evil spirits. But um, his patients will recount that there are wayward spirits who are trickster entities. Sometimes they like to come down and play jokes on people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do like to scare them just for fun. But they're not, they don't mean evil. They're not evil beings. They're just m mischief makers. And so they have to send rovers, beings that are called rovers, to come and fetch them, get them out of the Earth's astral plane and move them back to where they're supposed to be. So there are some mischief makers, but they're not yeah. evil in the sense in which we mean the term. They're just kind of bored. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because yeah. when you get out of your body, you can do all kinds, all these other dimensions are available to you to, to have fun with. And they figure, well, let's go fuck with the, the poor monkeys guys that are still stuck in <laughs> these monkey bodies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes me think, you say rover, and it made me immediately think of Mars rover, and I'm like, oh, the humans are LARPing as <laughs> rovers yeah. on Mars. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, this is kind of like tangential or switching gears a little bit, um, but kind of related, because I'm thinking about like the ways that, you know, we don't see, we didn't see Uranus until the 18th century, we didn't see Pluto until the 20th century, etc. And like, and the way that, um, sort of new planets and also new celestial objects play into the development of our folklore, the development of any kind of cosmology. I was reading a paper recently that was talking about, um, I forget the, the tribe uh, in southeastern Arizona, who have this whole cosmology of based on what they observe, physically observe with the naked eye in the sky. And they are looking at like space junk, like the satellite, the ISS, they see, I assume they see Starlink. Um, I where saw they are. it scared the hell out of me. I know, I know. I saw it the first time in 2021. Nobody warned and I was me. Same. Hey, guess what? Elon Musk just bought the Earth. <laughs> I know. Sorry you're the last to know, but now you know. <laughs> now it's just the sky. Yeah. sky. It and scared the, I thought it was a UFO. Same. And I, and I typed it up online. As, I just saw my first UFO. I was really excited. Yeah. Yeah, Some same. I was like, no, here, this, here's the image of the Starlink thing. You saw that. Yeah, it's, it's funny though. Scary. I haven't seen it since, but um, um, yeah, anyhow, go ahead. I, yeah, I, I can. The the most that I get when I can see Starlink is in the East Mountains out, oh, outside okay. of Albuquerque. It's really like you're you're sheltered from the Albuquerque light pollution in the mountain, and you can yeah. But but the the space junk is having an effect on people's like sort of folkloric cosmology. I bet. And they and they're sort of they have this anxiety about like what is happening like as above so below. What's mm -hmm. happening when we're trying to influence the above how are we influencing the below our bodies i just wonder if you have thoughts on that um yeah i did write an essay on that in the age of catastrophe mm -hmm. when i learned that uh two satellites collided in orbit for the first time oh, wow. and created a whole bunch of space debris i forget what year it was it might have been the book was published in 2012 so it might have been 2008 something like that or, or 2010 and i thought about that those the, those two satellites crashed and now there's all this space debris nobody's going to go out there and collect all that because yeah. it's dangerous to do. Um, a a, a two-pound piece of foam rubber brought down the space shuttle. 
And I remember the, the NASA guy uh, getting on and holding it up when they were first trying to figure out what had happened. This was the second spatial. Uh, and he says, I refuse to believe that a two pound piece of foam rubber like this brought down the space shuttle, but in <laughs> fact it did. As it was taking off, it gained whatever inertia or momentum to that foam thing that punched a hole in it. So it was sure. able to go out, but when it came back into the yeah. atmosphere, all this gas ran in and exploded it. So I thought about that and I thought, all of these dreams of leaving the Earth, all these Elon Muskian dreams of building space stations in orbit, orbiting hotels, sounds very iffy to me. If, if a two pound piece of foam rubber can bring down a, a gigantic craft yeah. like that, the whole endeavor sounds very shaky to me. And shortly after that, the movie Gravity came out, which was directed by Alfonso Cuaron, yeah. which explores exactly that same thing. But Cuaron, uh, Cuaron rather, uh, contacted me, an assistant of his oh, contacted cool. me, and said, Cuaron's a big fan of, of your work. He watches your YouTube videos. So we were supposed to meet out here. It fell through for whatever reason. Um, I'm not saying he, he got the, the, the idea from the chapter for Gravity, but they were like parallel mm. realizations. Um, that it, it, it looks very iffy getting off the earth with, with space debris and there's only going to be more and more of it. We're just going to keep polluting it. Yeah, it seems <clears> like there's this boundary. Well, in, within the, the adage of as above, so below, it seems like there's, you know, we might transcend the, that boundary between below and above, like f physically, like using science, but it's, there's, as you say, there's, there's a, a weakness in the armor every time. Uh, if, if rubber can bring it down, it just seems like there's a metaphysical boundary that we can never, yeah, uh, that we're correct. trying to mess with and no. it, it's potentially bad. And maybe it sounds like it could bring about another I, catastrophe. I'm very skeptical, skeptical about going to Mars anyway or any other planet because yeah. all we're going to do is bring the same mess to the, to the other planet. We're yeah. just going to pollute Mars next. Do That's all think, we're going to do. Do you think that that is like this desire to go to other planets is almost like this hyper Faustian pursuit to yes. preserve consciousness yeah. um this is also interesting to me because you also talk a lot about uh not apocalyptic things but like the anthropocene affecting the planet and then people having to move on mass to the north yeah uh, or south or south yeah either way the equatorial regions are going to be fried yeah so what do you think of mm. this like exchange between I, as I like to call it, the metaphysical north and the metaphysical south, and then this like crazy pursuit to try to preserve consciousness. And what are what do you think the consequences We're of that? We're kind of a mixed up civilization, aren't we? I mean, yeah. that's that's the whole problem. Yeah, global warming is real, and I'm convinced that it's man made. Um, the, the data all points to it. Um, it. You know, the temperatures start rising the moment we start in the latter part of the 19th century putting fossil fuels into the air, uh, hmm. CO2. And, carbon monoxide, um, yeah, and then the population reaches a billion right at the year 1900 for the first time. Um, then pretty soon everybody, 20 years later, everybody wants a car. And by the 1920s, they're, they're, they're normal, but they are polluting the atmosphere and it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. um, it'll take about five centuries. From the estimates that I read back when I wrote The Age of Catastrophe in 2012 was it'll take five centuries for all the ice to melt, um, Antarctica and Greenland, and the sea levels will rise about 70 feet. That's the maximum they can rise. That's, of course, end of the story for all coastal cities. They're all going to be gone. They're all going to be underwater. But I've been hearing lately people saying they've been revising the data and it's warming a lot faster than they oh. thought that it would. It may not be five centuries. It may be like two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a lot of work to do. We will have to slowly withdraw from our coastal cities all over the world. Notice that Russia... It has a unique, its capital culture is landlocked. Landlocked, St. Yeah. Petersburg's a goner. They've, they've been fighting water levels ever since it was created in the yeah. 18th century. Uh, that's a goner, but the Moscow is really nicely situated yeah. there for the future, isn't it? Uh, most cultural capitals are coastal cities. New yeah. York, Washington, England, yeah. LA, uh, London. <laughs> yeah, they're, most of them are coastal. So there will have to be a withdrawal from the coasts and a movement north to cooler latitudes. Greenland will open up as brand new real estate, though, when all yeah. that ice is gone, so there'll be a lot of places to uh, migrate to, to live on Greenland. So it's not as though we won't be able to live here, but it will be drastically different. The, the, out here, this is going to be a wasteland, the entire American Southwest. And I asked Oswald <laughs> Spangler this when I was using a medium to talk to him. 
I said, because um, you talk about in your book, Decline of the West, Spang Harris Spangler, I said, where you're talking about in uh, the Middle East, after the, uh, the Greco-Roman soul sort of withdrew from the Middle East, it left behind all these ghost towns, these Hellenistic ghost cities with the Hellenistic architecture all over the Middle East, like Petra and places like that, and Palmyra. And I said, do you th foresee something like that for big cities out here in the Southwest, like Phoenix and Albuquerque? And he said, absolutely, they're going to mm. be ghost towns. You yeah, bet. yeah. Um, this place is going to be unlivable with, yeah. with the droughts that will become, they're already a norm. And um, yeah, it's going to get hotter and hotter. Uh, the wonder. Southwest and also the Midwest will desertify. The Midwest has been a desert before, a Sahara-like desert. It'll, it'll resort back to that. Um, so everything's going to move north. More so. Yeah. How do you think that will coincide with like mass migration and uh, there's like a, uh, there was like obviously a decline of the West, but like what was that? What's that going to look like when everybody and their mother wants to go to Greenland or Canada? It's going to be a problem. <laughs> um, like look at the problems that uh, India will face with regards to Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh is at sea level. Uh, they're already dealing with flooding problems there, and so. Those people are going to want to get into India, and India doesn't want them there because they're Muslims. Yeah. So there's a big problem. So when you get these kinds of Malthusian traps, where you get um, an expanding population and diminishing resources, that means war. This, yeah. There's no other way. When you get to an unsolvable situation between two peoples, that means we're going to have to fight it out. Yeah. And that's how war happens. What do you think about, this might be an ignorant question because I don't know like how the poles figure into this, but what about the southern pole, like Antarctica? Would anybody try to move down there in this? I think it would be much less likely than okay. to go to Greenland, okay. which yeah. is, we, we know will be inhabitable because there's people living there right now on the coasts. Okay. You know, um, I think Antarctica will be problematic. Plus, it's much harder to get to. Right, and it's like shielded and yeah. yeah, yeah. And you have to go, and you would have to pass through these continents that would be a wasteland, I guess, right? Yeah, like that's right. North and South the America. Amazon is, is diminishing yeah. as we speak. It's disappearing. It will be gone. So people and that's a problem that. because the, the, uh, the Amazon rainforest is the Earth's air conditioning system. Uh, oh, those, yeah. th th that jungle vegetation is sucking down CO2 constantly out of the atmosphere. Um, if, if it doesn't have that river there, it's in trouble. The evapotranspiration of the rain uh, coming down and then being exhaled as uh, oxygen for us, uh, once that forest is gone, that's a big problem right there. Um, and then it's also being diminished by logging and right, so sure. forth, t taking down the trees. Yeah, I think like the, the woke <clears throat> leftist ideology and what they're telling us is, oh, we can turn around climate change if we stop using plastic straws, blah, blah, blah. Are you going to do, <laughs> yeah. in, my, in my opinion, and it's not that popular one of an opinion, is uh, prolong the process. Yeah. That's all yeah. it's going to do. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, do you think we're not going to migrate north until it's too late because people are deluded into thinking that they can do anything about They'll it? They'll gradually be pushed that way by all the storms that, that happen that For get sure. worse and worse in the United States every year. Yeah. Uh, with all the winter storms on the East Coast. Um, that one last year, was it last year or the year before? That was catastrophic where they had, uh, it was in uh, Buffalo, I think it was, which was under uh, just a shitload of feet mm -hmm. of snow. And yeah. people were dying in their cars because they mm -hmm. couldn't get out. Um, it'll gradually just push people away from the coasts. Yeah. Um, because even in three feet of water, our airports are peripheral. Usually they're out on the periphery of the city. Yeah. So they're going to be hit first. And in three feet of water, you can't land and take off with, with three feet of water. And that's just three feet. That's not that much. Um, so all this is going to have to be rethought. So we've got lots of work for those guys up there for coming down here and sending their best minds yeah. to help us figure this shit out because we're going to need <laughs> it. Um, it's going to be a mess, but um, we can do it. We're, we're smart. Yeah, I was also going to ask about like, because this is, there's, there's the ideology that, oh, well, we can stop all of this climate change and we should just like abolish plastic straws. But then, <laughs> there, then there's other people who are staunch anti-natalists because of this as well. And they say like, well, the earth is going to be inhabitable. Let's never have kids and just like start the extinction. Um, but then, and so I'm thinking about that. And then I'm also thinking about like the incarnation as your soul chooses to incarnate, what your soul is choosing to... Um, the obstacles to have in this lifetime and I'm also thinking about like what are the roles then of people who do have children and like parents and children what kind of like karmic agreements are being have, have you come across 
any sort of karmic agreements that parents and children have when it comes to like souls choosing to incarnate or do you have any thoughts with that? I don't know. You have to imagine why souls choose to incarnate in Ethiopia and live a life of starvation. Why do they do that? They, they choose it deliberately uh -huh. to undergo that experience because we all have to undergo something like that uh -huh. sooner or later. We, we all have to have every conceivable experience. It's, we've all, as the, the psychotherapist guy who also does regressive hypnosis, Brian Weiss says, we've all been murdered, we've all been murderers. Uh, no point pointing any fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all been there, done that. Um, we've all chosen terrible lives to live in, in, under terrible conditions such as famine and drought. Those are tests. Those are tests that the soul yeah. wants. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though you choose that to see if you can get through it. Mm. You choose it beforehand. And they have this room on the other side. It's a previewing room that souls go into uh, as they're trying to narrow down which set of parents that they should migrate to. Mm. Usually in consultation with their guides, they'll narrow it down to like two different couples in a nearby geographic zone that matches their karmic needs. And, but then they'll sit down and view, they'll have a future preview of what being incarnate as this person would be like, generally speaking, not all the specifics, but the general drift of it. So they choose. And if they choose a life like starvation in Ethiopia, it's because maybe they've never had that before and they need to see if they can do it successfully mm. and get through it. So each lifetime is like, it's like a test. It's like, a, you know, it's just like we do with sports. Can I do this? Can I set the bar higher every time and still high jump over it? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do with our lives. Mm -hmm. We choose, deliberately choose tough ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. For the people who do choose tough ones. Just There's... as the people who choose easy ones have chosen that. Yeah. Um, you incarnate in a beautiful body. You chose that. Now for women, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult challenge because culture values their beauty so much. And so when they want to incarnate, they naturally want to choose the most beautiful body possible. But the thing is, they might choose uh, to be a non-attractive woman if they want to emphasize their mind and develop that. Mm -hmm. Because it, what, what happens when you choose a solitary life to develop the mind, you have to withdraw from the outer world. And so very often a woman will choose a not-so-attractive body for that reason. I remember one near-death woman talking about how she had to have this accident and have her leg broken. Um, she was riding in a carriage and fell out of it and the wheel ran over her leg. Um, so she was housebound for the rest of her life, but she was able to develop her mind uh, and read and be solitary and write. Yeah. And she said, I, I chose that accident. I deliberately chose that to make sure that I would stay home and develop my mind. So we choose our looks. We choose how we look. Uh, the elephant man chose to incarnate as mm -hmm. the world's ugliest human being to see what that would be like. Mm -hmm. well, how do you deal with that shit? <laughs> and then uh, yeah. the, in the lessons that he teaches with other people to look past looks to the beauty. This man had a beautiful soul. Then that was the yeah. whole point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Online, there's a phenomenon right now, an influx of men who call themselves incels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. Oh, yeah, they, they flock on Twitter. That was one of the yeah. reasons why I was, go away. Which there seems to be so, so <laughs> many away. of these incels now. What do you think that their karmic balance is that they're, is what I think. that they're paying for in a past life? Were they womanizers? Probably. Or, hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yep. Yeah. If you have a life, and I've heard this over and over again, a woman will be under hypnosis and she'll say, wow, I've had a lot of sexual lives. And then that explains why the nun lifetime yeah. right now I'm a nun yeah. and, and a couple of times in a row she's a nun and to balance that karma out so it all comes out in the water Casanova's an insult yeah. probably yeah. everyone gets to do everything <laughs> so when you're like choosing new lives and whatnot, and as humanity like the monkeys are becoming one with the machine or whatever and the way we're choosing lives do you I remember one time you were talking about your Wikipedia page. You had a Wikipedia page. And Briefly, then you yeah. then it, you got like unpersoned basically. Yes. Um, yeah. How do you, okay, so as we're becoming well with the machine, how is that going to affect our reincarnations? Now the Wikipedia thing is very amusing because <laughs> I created my Wikipedia page myself when I was working an office job and I was bored. Mm -hmm. and, and this was back when the internet <coughs> was just, it was like 03 or something like that. It was just getting going. So I created my own page, made it as objective as I possibly could, and then I put it up. And it stayed there for about five years. And then I started publishing books. And then after my fifth book, I did five books with publishers, with actual legitimate real pu publishers. 
and I got completely fed up with them. They take all your money. Most people don't know this. They take 90% of your royalties. You only keep 10%, mm -hmm. which is next to nothing if you're writing intellectual books. Yeah. For my book, The New Media Invasion, I make about $30 a year off of that book. And so I thought, well, here's Amazon and all this new self-publishing stuff. I'll go on there and experiment. Uh, and lo and behold, now uh, the books actually make some money. Uh, not, a, not a lot, but way more than I ever made uh, using traditional publishers. And plus, I didn't have to make compromises because every publisher would want me to change something I didn't want to change. Change the title of the book, change the chapter titles, and I want it a certain way. So now I have complete 100% control. So after I self-published maybe five books, Wikipedia takes my page down because they say now I'm not a real, a real author. I'm not? What about those first five books I published with real publishers? There are authors who've only written five books who are on there with real publishers. So what the hell? There's no logic here. So I roasted them in my book, New Media Invasion. Uh, I called Wikipedia a fake encyclopedia. There's nothing real about it. You cannot have an encyclopedia with a constantly shifting database. If I go and look up an article on Napoleon and what some person put up there yesterday is, has been deleted now, so that fact that was true yesterday is, no, is not true today, because somebody went in there and deleted it, that's not, a, that's not an encyclopedia at all. It's, so what Wikipedia is, is rumors about mm -hmm. knowledge. These are rumors that people say these things are true. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And I think somebody read that at, over at Wikipedia, and so they don't, they don't like me and I don't like them. <laughs> nice, yeah. Yeah, because I was just wondering about all the, <clears throat> in conjunction with like the QR code, and even mm -hmm. climate change and how like, this really, this thing that is actually happening will be weaponized with a QR code. Like you can only get this much meat or something. You have like a credit, social credit score. And I'm just like, and I'm wondering about how, like how that will coincide with lives. And like as a, a monkey becomes one with a machine and like what that will, what that will mean for uh, going through pain and love. Will we even yeah. be able to experience pain and love the same way if we're one Well, this is what our, our movies are about. Um, when I wrote my book, Celluloid Heroes, Mechanical Dragons, back in 2005, I noticed all these science fiction films full of images of homicidal robots, uh, the Terminator films, mm -hmm. or the, the, the Phantom Menace, where you get armies of homicidal robots. And that started in two, with, uh, 1968 with 2001 A Space Odyssey with HAL and Dave Bowman's battle with HAL 9000. So on the outer side of things, the way things look. We think all these gadgets are neat. We can do this, we can do all kinds of weird things. But since movies are like public dreams, and so we're having nightmares about our machines, unconsciously, the psyche is uncomfortable with this mm. situation mm. and the rate that it has yeah. to, that's being forced to adapt to this mechanization. Mm. Mechanization takes command is the title of a book by Siegfried Gideon. And that's exactly what's happening. So you'll see these just as if you're having traumas or problems in your waking life and your dreams will feature means of figuring, unraveling those knots that are blocking you. Maybe you have PTSD or something, you have nightmares. Same thing here, the, we'll see it worked out in our films. Films like AI, Artificial Intelligence, uh, the Steven Spielberg, Stanley Kubrick film has that exact question that you're asking. Uh, they make this boy robot who's a robot who is unique because he can love. He can love and he can dream. And so he's unique. So what do we do with that? And we're going to, I mean, that can also be read as a metaphor for genetic engineering because we're only going to develop eventually human clones. They're going to happen. And the way that, mm -hmm. that they will happen is, is the following. You'll go to your, uh, your doctor and your doctor will say, your child has a, a cleft palate. We can go in and remove that, that cleft palate. You want us to do that? Yes. And then she'll say, can you make his eyes blue? at the same, that, that we'd like that, that'd be really nice. That's how it's gonna start. And then so these requests will eventually turn into tailor-made humans. Now, are those human then? Are they, that's gonna be the big issue. That the, our, our arts yeah. are gonna have to, our novels, our films are gonna have to address and dramatize for us yeah. like waking dreams. What's human and what isn't here? Yeah. It's going to get very, very confusing. If you think it's confusing now, we're just getting going. Yeah. Um, I asked Friedrich Nietzsche when I used a medium to interview him because I figured you know, with the Superman, he would know something about genetic engineering and so forth. And he said, uh, absolutely, it's going to happen. Uh, somewhat fur further down the road, maybe a century or two, but yes, absolutely. Mm. We, you will have clones and you will have these problems. Uh, tr there will be racial issues regarding 
you know, synths versus, you know, the womb-born, let's say. Yeah, yeah, organic. Mm. <laughs> um, now, uh, these clones are womb-born. I should, I should clarify by saying they are born from a womb. What they'll do is uh, they'll take a, uh, an egg and they'll take the, uh, the sperm and fertilize the egg in, in a dish. Then they'll put that blastula into a woman's womb sure, for it to yeah. develop. That's how clones are done now with monkeys and so forth. Yeah. They, they've cloned a lot, but they, uh, the success rate isn't very good. There's a lot of abortive uh, creations. Uh, and who gets to, what about the abortions? What about the ones right. that are yeah, okay. experiments on the side that don't work and we right. just toss them out, these lives? Um, Dolly, the sheep, was morbidly obese. She was the first clone. They always have something weird wrong with them. They're so they're not getting something right. Something isn't right. They're excited about this new monkey that they cloned. I forgot what his name is. It seems to be doing well. But, uh, well, you can see them moving up the chain of being from yeah. animals yeah. and rabbits. And, oh, what's next? Monkeys. And then what's next yeah, after we're done with yeah. monkeys? Well, apes, gorillas, mm -hmm. and then what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can see them doing it, right? Step by step. So if we can create humans at some point, um, and considering the trajectory we're on, like moving from one age to another... What about religion? Like, obviously, there's more of this new age theosophical bent in the way we think. Yeah. What? Uh, when do you think we'll start moving away from like Abrahamic ontology and stuff? I think what if you think about uh, the Westward Empire, the Faustian civilization, constantly migrating west, discovery of America, East Coast is settled, and then constantly moving west. Takes them a while to get out here to the Southwest and then to California. Um, and in that process, they're laying uh, a thin crust of Faustian civilization, which includes Christianity, on top mm -hmm. of what's already there, namely Native American mythology mm -hmm. and ontology. And so they're laying that on top of it. But the rules of history always say it takes a long time, but it's the same in every case. When the incoming population, like with India, you get the uh, Indo-Aryans coming in, the Harappan people are already there. They've already gone through their culture cycle. Um, and they intermix, and they become regarded as inferior. Da's use their dark-skinned Aboriginal inhabitants. Uh, they look like uh, the, the Aborigines from Australia. Same, same type of really dark skin. Gradually, though, <clears throat> the native the people who have been in the land the longest and whose mythologies are therefore much stronger, much, much stronger, mm. those mm -hmm. gradually come up mm -hmm. and through a process that anthropologists call acculturation. Uh, they come up and they slowly overcoat and transform. So yoga was the native religion, yoga and goddess worship. The Indo-Aryans didn't have that. They were patriarchal. Uh, they didn't have goddess worship. They didn't have reincarnation karma or yoga. When those two streams come together, then we get modern Hinduism, which is hmm. the only religion in the world that worships the goddess as the central figure. Um, that was a gradual acculturation process. So I think we're seeing the same thing. We will see the same thing in North America. What will happen is that the Christian overlay will move as it has been moving from east to west, but then it's going to shift the other way and move with the New Age spirituality from west to east, hmm. and it's going to slowly engulf the continent, the, the New Age spirituality, a lot of which is drawn from Native American mythology yeah. and so forth. Uh, and plus, we've already seen part of the acculturation process. Uh, we've already seen it with our superhero movies. Uh, half of them are Native American characters. Yeah. Batman, Spider-Man, Spider-Woman. Ant-Man, Wasp, Wolverine, those are all Native American characters. So we can already see yeah. the acculturation process that's coming up to the top. Well, yeah. And pretty soon it will just digest and devour what's up there. And I think New Age spirituality will be the, the thing that comes in, breaks down Christianity, digests it, dissolved it. Now Rudolf Steiner tried to save Christianity. And I think for him, uh, his cosmology for me comes the closest that we're going to get to the way things really actually are. But he tries to save Christianity because... Um, the, the incarnation, what he calls the Golgotha event, is the central event in his whole uh, cosmology. So he tries to save it, but um, I don't know. I'm a little doubtful that, that it can be saved. I, I think Christianity is so hostile yeah. to nature, to the body, to the genitals, to all these basic things that it, it just, it's a women, it just doesn't seem like it's going to be a physical, a workable thing. Yeah. Now I know the Russians are awakening. As Spengler predicted that they would, they would be entering their springtime spirituality right about now, and their version of Christianity is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. So it may survive there. Uh, so like but Eastern Orthodox, yeah, would survive. Yep, yep. Um, so it may, it may just go 
the globe may bifurcate into two halves, where one half, half is Orthodox Christian, uh, and the other half is this New Age spirituality that's mm. kind of like, or at least like in America. Atheistic. Maybe not Europe, because uh, the European Christianity is so rooted in the soil there. But over here in North America, our consciousnesses have not had time to root. They, they just haven't had enough time. The development's yeah. been so fast, so it's therefore s still very brittle and yeah. flaky. It's like a crust that you can just flake away uh, and get to the new stuff that's coming yeah. in. I think that's what'll happen. I have two things to say. <clears throat> One is a question, but, but first before that is just a comment. I've been hearing a lot of people sort of come to the same conclusion where they're thinking like, there's all sorts of strange cryptids and like folkloric creatures that people are encountering on the North American continent. Yeah. You see that yeah. definitely in the Southwest, right. in Appalachia, things like that. And people don't, like they're, they're horrific and scary and people are terrified of them because we have come to this continent most of us being being from Europe, from the old world, and we don't know how to interface with them. Whereas, like it's f things like fairies and gnomes can be really scary. Like the folklore clearly yeah. describes them as terrifying, but it, they've also been sort of infantilized as well because the people in Europe have had centuries. They're rooted, and they've had centuries to interface with the sort of cryptids of Europe, like mm -hmm. fairies and gnomes, things like that. So, yeah, they turn up in the fairy and folk tales. Uh, yeah, yeah, and whereas like they're still the the skinwalkers and uh, Windigos or whatever in Appalachia, like those are still terrifying because we haven't had, we've only been here for like 200 years. That's right. The um, Native Americans, and the Native Americans have know. them in their mythology. Right. And the shamans the, can, the Hopi do, yeah. as you say, and the Navajo skinwalkers do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They still survive there. They still recognize those beings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, the Ray beings too, in those Ray sessions, they said a Bigfoot is real. Um, they said it's a real being that exists on the, on the actual physical plane, but that it's really good at hiding in caves um, and is very shy. It's, it's very smart about avoiding people. Where um, is he now? So, what's that? Where is he now? They. There's some they. species. Uh, I don't know. They, they, they were in the vague. forest? Yeah, they were vague about it. They okay. said they're good at hiding in forests. Hmm. They're like um, a lot of our forests no, are still really Collins, unknown. Collins, I mean, Collins, Collins. we don't know that much about our forests. There's, there's a lot yeah. of space there that has not been fully mapped and charted a lot of, especially up in the Northwest, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the cave, like down in Carlsbad, there's still new discoveries being made yeah. in Carlsbad Caverns all the time. That's really scary. There's like this lake that is untouched mm -hmm. water. Um, so, I mean, yeah, who knows what kind of life forms and then what sort of like morphologies have, have come from there too. Right. Um, but my other question though too is, because I have similar thoughts about, um, about Christianity and why Christianity can't prevail in its current in its current paradigm, paradigm. Um, and I see it through the lens of like the astrological ages and sort of thinking about like, we're exiting the age of Pisces yep. actively. And so that's kind of Christianity is fading and all sort of monotheistic the, and, the, the and fishes, the age of the fish God. Yeah. 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 And this, and this sort of saviorism messianic complexes that is necessarily fading because of the end of the age of Pisces. But then as we enter into the age of Aquarius, I wonder, I wonder just what you think about the astrological ages. I think it's really, uh, moving into the age of Aquarius is really appropriate if you think about that yeah. sign. Yeah. It's all about water, flooding. Yeah. And Aquarius himself, I figured out, is the flood hero that Noah's based on, Udnapishtim, yeah. that Gilgamesh goes to visit. It was Aquarius that he yeah. was going to visit. Uh, and he's the one who survives the floods. Uh, he, I figured out the math, too, that... Um, he had survived 25,000 years earlier, and that's a complete procession, 25,920 years. So they were fully aware uh, that this was meant to his journey, Gilgamesh's journey, down the Persian Gulf to Bahrain, which is where Nepishtim lives. And uh, they have found a, a water cult there, a baptismal cult, a little shrine set up to a water god there named Enzak. Um, so it's very appropriate as, as we're moving into the age of floods and flooding. Yes. And Aquarius is a technological sign. It's not a spiritual sign. Right. Uh, it's a sign about technology. So that's, we'll need to be building technologies against the flood because that's, it's a very appropriate yeah. uh, sign. Yeah. We're not there yet. It's another century or so off, but yeah. it's, it's coming up. Network spirituality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Network. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Groups. I would, yep. oh, I would say all three of us are very tapped into the age of Aquarius. I mean, mm -hmm. as I'm sort of been yep. tapped into it very technically because of my background as an astrologer, but I think that both of you have expressed it. Maybe not directly, but 
Mm-hmm. Well, you're coming out of the millennial generation, which is Uranus conjunct Neptune. Right. Uranus is also yeah. linked with technology, Neptune with spirituality. That's why you've got spirituality in the form of the images that go through our little gadgets. That's the Neptunian flow going through the Uranian oh, yeah. technological gadgets. And so your generation is uh, channeling spirituality through. And it is a form because it, it's a form of spirituality because yeah. anything visionary, anything that uh, is coded in terms of images is Neptunian. The archetypes yeah. of the collective unconscious, dreams, movies, that's all Neptunian mm-hmm. energy. Mm-hmm. And we have a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in two years, I think. Yeah, Saturn, Saturn, Neptune. Yep, that's right. So that might be a interesting blackout of images. Uh, it might. It, that can. Uh, Saturn always wants discipline and restriction, uh, so there'll be some kind of bottleneck there mm-hmm. that, that will when, when po- impossible to images. predict. But yeah. what's up? Do you think that's like Hollywood really officially dying, perhaps? Oh, Hollywood? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> I don't know. It would depend on transits for Los Angeles. You'd have to do a geographic mm-hmm. transit thing and look. That's what I wanted to ask you about as well, because we're moving more inward and up north. And one of the, because we're not so rooted in the states and people move from city to city and wealth can move. Like Detroit was once wealthy, obviously. Mm -hmm. What cities or do you think will be burgeoning uh, centers of wealth in the next century? Um, London should do just fine. I don't, Mm -hmm. I think they're very well situated um, in any place in Canada. Places like Toronto, um, that's good because it's, isn't it away from the water? There's uh, the Great Lakes. Yeah, well, there's the, the lakes, yeah. Um, that's all going to be good real estate up there. Canada mm-hmm. will be warmer than it is now and much more livable. And I understand there's a lot of good soil up there, too, for agriculture. Um, so it'll just naturally migrate that way. When a, when a terrain becomes so problematic that you can't live in it, like with uh, hurricanes, we're going to be entering hurricane season in a few months, um, once that region just becomes devastated by hurricanes and tornadoes, um, it becomes unlivable, the population will move. You can see uh, in the Indus Valley, when uh, Mohenjo Daro was up and running uh, about 2500 BC, and then it's wiped out by about 1900 BC, but you could see they, they were having problems with the Indus River was constantly flooding the city, and they kept having to rebuild it. And every time they would rebuild it, the archaeologists could see that it was more slovenly than the time before that. And finally, they just ran out of gas and said, fuck it, mm-hmm. and just the population left. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just the natural process that will happen when a place becomes unlivable, it pushes people away. Mm-hmm. Did we used to time travel? Not that I'm aware of. Not, uh, you can time travel when you're out of your body because you can enter into any time you want. Um, there are books called the Akashic Library that many people say they see on the other side where you can pull out volumes that have recorded uh, not only historical events but the entire lifetime of some individual whose life that you would like to study and you open it and it's live action moving images as you turn the pages you can also enter into that reality if you if you so desire so that's where everything is is uh, recorded in these volumes of the akashic library and they like to go in there and study them and study history historical events and so you can time travel in that sense i don't yeah. think we can do it in a in a physical form. How do you access the Akashic records? That's a good question. <laughs> you have to have the clairvoyant the ability yeah. that Steiner sure. had. Somehow he could do it. I, 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 I actually did do it once uh, with that same girlfriend who committed suicide. We were drunk one night, uh, pillow talk, and then all of a sudden I started channeling one of her Egyptian lives. And I don't know mm-hmm. how I did it, but I just saw it all of a sudden, and we hadn't been talking about reincarnation or anything like that because I wasn't you know, that much into it at that point. And um, I said, hey, you were this slave woman and there was this bald slave guy that um, was married and he liked you, you were his favorite slave girl because he could confide in you about his marital problems. Um, But then you stole from him and you had to have your hand cut off at at one point. And I just went on like this for 15 minutes. And I don't know how I did it, but then later, I asked a medium years later after she was gone and I was using mediums to talk to her. I asked a medium if that was real and the medium said, yes, you, you channeled the Akashic record there. Mm. I have no idea how I did it. Mm. The only altered state I was in was I was a bit drunk from beer. That was it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Altered substances, s- substances that alter your consciousness do make it easier yeah. to access the spiritual worlds, but it can also mess you up to the point where you can't tell yeah. the difference. And you get these people who are just 
who've taken too much LSD, taken too much of this, like Ozzy Osbourne, who could get, barely get a sentence out uh, yeah. because he's just fried his brain on every conceivable drug. And then it just becomes this limp liquid thing where there's no membrane dividing self from cosmos. Oh. That membrane is there for a reason. It's so you don't go crazy. Because this is what happens when a person goes schizophrenic. They lose that mm -hmm. boundary yeah. distinction between what's real and what isn't. Then it, it's, and it's very Neptunian because Neptunian, yeah. Neptunian can confuse you, um, your reality function, and then they, they can't tell the difference. And that's why people um, with poorly aspected Neptunes have such a substance abuse problem. Yes. And yeah, they'll yeah. have like a Neptune Sun conjunction or Saturn might be in there, some, something like that. Yeah. Also, people who, who, when they choose suicide, they choose overdoses, it's usually with Neptune on their Sun. There'll be hmm. Neptune Sun hmm. for overdoses. Violent suicides by either hanging or gunshot will be a Pluto Saturn thing because that's the constriction of the infant trying to get out of the birth canals. You do the same thing when you hang yourself, it's a struggle. Yeah. Uh, or shoot yourself, it's a sudden explosive release. Hmm. Um, so even the forms of suicide that we choose as a species are, are linked to our planets. Hmm. Wow. And with, with this membrane thing, uh, that shouldn't dissolve or else you'll go nuts, uh, how does that deal with shamans and who are our shamans today? Right, the shamans are the ones who are expert at it uh, because they have been self-trained when they go out on a vision quest and they're out, they, either they fast, um, usually for a couple of weeks they'll be out there by themselves and they'll, they'll do all kinds of things to induce a vision. And the visions will just simply be the opening to the Akashic world, the astral plane. They'll just open it and a spirit form will come to them and choose them and say, I'm your spirit form. It's probably one of their guides, let's say, but the group's guides. But it, it can appear like in an animal totem form. And then that becomes uh, their form and then they're just expert at going in and out of that consciousness. Mm -hmm. They just are professionals at it, whereas another person might go crazy because they don't have the built-in defense mechanisms. Uh, like I do, for instance, I, nothing astral scares me whatsoever, not even ghosts. It just doesn't bother me because I know that I, what's real and what isn't, how I can jack in and jack out. Um, most people are, I, found, I found are afraid to talk to mediums. I have recommended them over and over again to my astrology clients and none of them will do it. Even ones who say, mm -hmm. okay, give me the link and I'll think about it and I never hear from them. One guy did it um, and got back to me. He, he talked to, to one of his favorite philosophers. And he said, yeah, it was him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know the guy, man, it was, it was him. She wasn't making that up. Um, and it's no big deal. It's like, it's like having a conversation with a regular person. Yeah. Uh, for, for Christmas, what my brother and I did, what, because most of our relatives are on the other side, it's just him and I left, uh, and my son uh, in Boulder, and our aunt. And uh, so I said, well, let's, let's do a, a get-together. Let's have all our dead relatives. And I, he's like, great idea. So we did, we got the medium on, this was just last Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said hi to everyone, mother, father, stepfather, even though I hate his guts, but he was nice, nonetheless. <laughs> um, and uh, my dead girlfriend, Mary, uh, showed up. Um, some of our dead friends, uh, everyone was there. It was really wonderful. Um, and all it is, there's nothing scary about it. It's just like talking, to, having a conversation over the phone to a friend. Yeah. That's all it is. There's nothing creepy about it. <laughs> For some reason, I, I, there's also the gullibility aspect that people feel gullible mm -hmm. and they don't want to feel that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doing they it, they don't want to feel like they're being made a fool out of. I can guarantee you, I'm I'm the most non-gullible person in the world. You couldn't put anything over on me if you tried. I'll sense it. My I have a very good reality detector, and uh, there's there's nothing gullible here. This is this is all real stuff, um, and I, yeah, I've spent years working on this stuff. This wasn't something, you know, that uh, came to me while I was uh, taking a dump in a gas station one night <laughs> and I was bored. You know, th this has been a gradual process mm -hmm. over. Seven years at least, but longer than that, because I was studying near-death experiences probably 10 years ago, but I remember back in 2008, mm -hmm. even more, uh, was when I started getting really curious about it with the near-death uh, videos. Yeah. Um, you... So it's been, a, it's been a slow, gradual thing. And the gullibility thing, I remember like pulling up the videos on channeling Eric with them interviewing like the Buddha and Jesus and feeling very gullible watching these videos, thinking to myself, there's no fucking way. This can't be true. Um, you sort of have to get over that. Yeah. You just gradually settle into it. 
like with anything, uh, once you settle into it and it becomes your world, then you know you can tell what's real and what isn't. I've spotted some phonies. I've spotted some guys uh, going on and on about their past incarnations that I knew were fake mm -hmm. um, because I know a lot about history. One guy was going on and on about how he was Peter. Oh, uh, Christ's uh, dis disciple Peter. Hmm. Well, it was funny because he goes, and of the Gospels, he really liked the John Gospel. That was his favorite. And I thought to myself, this guy does not know that the Mark Gospel, the first Gospel written, was held in conversation with Peter. Mark is interviewing Peter in Alexandria. Why would the John Gospel be his favorite hmm. Gospel? It should be the, the Mark Gospel because those are Peter's words. He didn't know that. Hmm. So then I went and I asked a medium and I said, is the guy bluffing? And she said, yes, he's full of shit. <laughs> so you do get these guys out yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. that are, he was clearly on an ego trip. He was just going on and on about how great he was. Um, yeah, they're easy to spot. Just channeling Eric.com or just channeling uh, Eric? It'll be, uh, it, they have it on YouTube, ch mm -hmm. the channeling Eric channel. Mm -hmm. ch channeling Eric channel. <laughs> it's on uh, YouTube. Uh, yeah, so they're, Eric knows me. He shows up every time because I, I specifically mm. select a medium from that website so they know Eric. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, we, Eric and I know each other. He helped me get through my girlfriend's suicide. He also told me it was going to happen and I didn't realize it. Mm. Um, he told me a couple of months, I was talking with him via a medium and he said, uh, it's not over with you guys yet because we had broken up for the last and final time as far as I was concerned. And he said, it's not over with you guys yet. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, uh, it's not over. And I got apprehensive and I thought, like, is, uh, is something bad going to happen? And he says, it could, it could get ugly. It could. Mm. That's as much as he was probably allowed yeah. to tell me. But uh, yeah, he, he knew it was coming. And then so after it was over, he helped me. You know, we talked to him a lot. He, he, he's a good kid. He's very helpful. Uh, why was he only allowed to tell you that much? Why couldn't he just uh, say? It, it, they can't reveal things to you that you're not supposed to know that might fuck up the whole yeah. point of your incarnation. Yeah, yeah. So even when I'm asking them questions, they will only, sometimes they're evasive. Sometimes the medium will say, I'm not getting a response. Yeah. That means they don't, they can't lie to you. So that's the thing. They can't lie, but they can not respond. And I, um, I feel like mm -hmm. I've had this, I've come to this conclusion too. Like there are some things that we sh are specifically not supposed to predict. Like there's like, visions of the future that we shouldn't know because yeah then you'll like sabotage it you'll sabotage the entire lesson right. as you say or sabotage your entire timeline yep. because you're trying defeats to defeats the purpose up. of the right. incarnation right yeah. yeah 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 after everything you've learned and all of your experiences with the other side and others who have crossed over are you afraid of death no not at all i'm afraid of suffering into death uh, yeah. i don't want that uh but no no i'm not the least bit concerned with it that that's the easy part when they, uh, some of the spirits i remember one of them saying birth is a lot harder than uh, death you've already yeah. done the hard part <laughs> death is, is easy com yeah. by comparison it's the birth process that's the bitch um yeah but we do it anyway the soul doesn't care it doesn't care about difficulties it, it knows it's infinite and it can get through anything <laughs> so we come down here pretty confident that we can do it. If we chose to do it, we came here by choice, all of us. Um, we were pretty certain that we could handle whatever the situation was. Hmm. Um, that's the good thing about recovering this paradigm. It, it helps put, you know, straighten people out and they realize that the circumstances, they're not victims. They're not being punished by the world. They have chosen this particular set of difficulties uh, for whatever reason that, that, that their souls need. It's all chosen uh, and it's all done for a reason. Once you have that paradigm uh, it just makes life so much more valuable because you realize everything is valuable yeah. every encounter is non-random every every conversation you have um it is all there for a purpose you're trying to get somewhere yeah. and do something there is a point to life yes there's no, it's, there's no such thing as a point pointless life that yeah. Yeah. sometimes i get astrology clients who are depressed and they'll be like i just feel like my life is worthless and i'll say well let's go through your chart and we'll figure out why yeah. and you feel that way. And eventually we figure it out. They do and they feel better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, okay, there's a plan to this madness. Yeah. It's not just chaos. Yeah, we chose to be here. And mm -hmm. every action we take is in service to the evolution of our own soul. It is, even if you choose a rough one. Like I remember the Uvalde massacre mm -hmm. and all those kids being killed. And I remember a medium saying, um, 
I think I may have asked a question about them. Did they choose that to be killed that way? And, and she said, well, uh, all the souls of those children agreed that they would go out early to give lessons in grief to their parents because you, you have to learn what grief is. You have to go through it. So as a group, they all agreed to, to go out somehow um, that way. Mm-hmm. So they chose it. Wow. And it's uh, for teaching lessons to the parents. You, grief, grief. You have to learn what it feels like. All of us do. We all have to lose some, someone we love so we can go through that process. And it makes the soul stronger as it survives grief. It gets mm-hmm. stronger. It puts down roots. And it makes you stronger. And pretty soon you begin to realize you could survive anything. That's just a gradual realization as you go through your challenges that you've already chosen anyway. So the astrolog- I think of the astrological map then uh, as a map that shows all the karmic tasks that you've agreed to. And it's in there like uh, the mainspring of an old-fashioned clock that you yeah. wind up and it just unwinds. Yeah. And as it unwinds, you know, the planets make the proper configurations that will correspond to the situations that will manifest archetypally in your life during those transits. So it's a map it's of, of what yeah. your karma is. You've already chosen but it. But it's not completely deterministic. A lot of people think, well, then it's all deterministic. No, it isn't because you have free will and your higher self doesn't know once it's energy is incarnate in a physical self what it's going to do yeah that's the whole game it has free will uh your girlfriend commits suicide are you going to join her and commit suicide too or are you going to make it through the grief and be a stronger person for it the higher self doesn't know so that's a decision a free will decision that's made by the soul you've agreed to these disasters that happen to you um but you don't your soul doesn't know how you're going to respond and how you respond is what the game is because to everything that happens to you that you re- survive and grow and respond is fine-tuning your karma for the next incarnation because the next incarnation will logically unfold out of the decisions that you have made in these particular circumstances as you go through them. It'll change. Um, if you hurt people, you're going to be hurt uh, next time around. If you're evolved at a point where you no longer use violence, then kindness and compassion is going to be more your concern and you're going to be fine-tuning that so that you will have an even more compassionate lifetime next time you'll be thinking more. The goal is to get all of us to think more and more about others. Mm -hmm. That's the whole goal of the whole evolutionary process. Love. 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 It is. (laughs) Yes. I have one question that seems like a complete non sequitur, but um, what did Rudolf Steiner say say about people like Marx who also used a sort of scientific method? I don't understand your question. What did he say about like somebody like um, like Marx and how he viewed the world? Oh, Karl Marx. Yeah. Well, he, I can. <laughs> he said that Marx and Engels had karma together because Engels stole Marx's property uh, during an incarnation that they had in the Middle Ages, hmm. where wow. uh, Marx was this guy who owned all this property, uh, like a fiefdom maybe, and then he left to go on an adventurous campaign to get more stuff. And then while he was gone, Engels was leading a group who took over his plantation or whatever it is. And then when he got back, he was shit out of luck. And then so they had to reverse the karma. When they came back, Engels pays all his bills so he can write this whole thing about private property and what a sin it is (laughs) because he's had it taken away from him. Um, That's what Steiner says about Marx and Engels. So it was just like a personal beef that mm-hmm. manifested this whole thing that yep. has like changed the course of... <laughs> that's exactly right. <that. laughs> okay, wow, that's uh-huh. fascinating. Yep. Thank you. I know that was like, sounded really like out of pocket, but <laughs> I just, I was listening to like a, like a, like a lecture, lecture of his or something and he mentioned Marx and then I completely forgot it. So you were my spark notes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Good. Cool. What else is on your mind? I think we've covered most of. Yeah. Okay. We, we hit all the big. That was pretty thorough. Yeah. 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 Thank you for being patient with us. Oh, absolutely. No, it's my pleasure. <laughs> uh, I'm just glad you guys are interested in all this. Stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. Hard to find people who were willing to talk about it. You know, not be dismissive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Most people are. Uh, know, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. If it's people great. are interested in learning more about your work. Where can they find you? Um, so I'm all over the internet. So I, I have a YouTube channel that has about a thousand videos on it, free to watch. So it's on there, the John David Ebert channel. And then I've got the school, the John David Ebert school. That's on teachable.com. And uh, there are links on my Facebook page to get on there. 
Um, we're reading through Finnegan's Wake right now, but I think the next class we're getting back to go, we're getting ready to go back to the Greeks to read Plato and the pre-Socratics. We're okay. going to go start from the beginning of Western philosophy because we've already gone through Indian philosophy. Uh, we finished that, so now it's going to be Western philosophy. Um, so it, just Google my name, just type it in, and all kinds of stuff will come up. And, you know, and all the books that you've published. The books are on Amazon, too. Okay. Yeah, the 30 books, and I'm working on three or four or five more. I don't know. I find myself... Uh, I went through a slump during that whole Pluto square yeah. Saturn period where I thought it was over. I wasn't going to write again. And uh, so it's good to be, have that energy back and, and it's yeah. just flowing right along beautifully. So it's yeah. good to have that creativity back. Um, yeah. This yeah. is an awesome conversation. Yeah. Well, likewise, I feel the same. Thank yeah. you for yeah. having yeah. me over here, guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah.